Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so you've heard the title of my talk today, Gender Garveyism and the Racial Geographies of Belonging in Costa Rica. Somewhat of an ambitious thing for 50 minutes, but let's give it a try. So uh, to help you, guide, to guide you along uh, what I'll be saying today, here's an outline of how this talk will go. In the first part of the presentation, I'm going to offer some context on Afro-Central America and the racial politics of citizenship and belonging in Costa Rica. I'll then discuss the UNIA in Limon, focusing on the gendered contours of, and entanglements of race, gender, and sexuality, which I show are at the core of Garveyism. And then I'm, I'm going to use an analytical framework that I call redemptive geographies to examine these entanglements. So I'll give you just a snapshot of that. And then I'll conclude with a brief examination of the legacies of Garveyism and the UNIA in contemporary Costa Rica. So as you heard, I'm working on my first book in progress. And this presentation is a slice of that larger project titled Between Nation and Diaspora, Garveyism, Black Citizenship, and the Racial Geographies of Belonging in Costa Rica. And here I want to, I want to note that I use the term West Indians to refer to English-speaking Afro-Caribbean labor migrants from the British West Indies, in the case of Costa Rica, primarily from Jamaica. And I also use this term to refer to their offspring born in Costa Rica. So this is in large part based on the time period in which I'm doing my research. And uh, the population that I look at are still identifying themselves as West Indian, people of the British crown. But I'm looking at this period of transition where they're moving from migrant to uh, full citizens of Costa Rica. So my book project then explores the relationship between race and belonging, and I'm investigating these uh, West Indian migrants who are stateless workers in the banana enclave of Limon and their movement to formal citizen. My research examines the participation of this population in Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, or the UNIA and their local practices and applications of Garveyism on the ground in Limon. And I find that this period between 1920 and 1970 is really important, and this is a significant historical juncture in the development of black citizenship in Costa Rica, as West Indians for most of this time period were placeless and without formal citizenship. And what I, why I think this work is so important um, is because in many ways this process of black citizenship is unfinished. Right, and we know that this is true, not just in Latin America, but also in our part of the Americas as well. So what the archives show, and, and part of what I do is to look at some of the lesser utilized um, archival sources like black newspapers in Latin America. So West Indians publish their own local newspapers, and that for me is a major source. So what I see then uh, in looking at some of these sort of Garveyite newspapers in Latin America are these entanglements of Pan-African politics and gender and sexuality. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in the talk. So I'm thinking about how gender and sexuality were central to how West Indians defined and refashioned blackness and claimed black suitability for modern citizenship. So my central argument is that West Indian residents simultaneously claimed fitness for Costa Rican citizenship and at the same time formed alternative diasporic spaces of belonging that situated them at the interstices of nation and diaspora. So I'm very much interested in the ways that West Indians navigate, challenge, craft, complex geographies of belonging, not only in Limon and in Costa Rica at large, but within a larger African diaspora. To understand the dynamics of Afro-Central America requires that we acknowledge the multiple and overlapping African diasporas and entangled colonial histories that constitute that space. These multiple African diasporas include the diaspora of enslaved Africans and their descendants in colonial Central America, the dispersal of uh, Garifuna people in places like Guatemala and Honduras, the Creoles of Nicaragua, and central to my research, of course, British West Indian labor migrations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This under-theorized diaspora represents a distinct black experience and identity in Latin America 
and uh, shows this overlap in the spaces of Central America and the Caribbean. This is a population that very, very much is in between these two uh, spaces. So in the late 19th century, West Indians migrated to various locations along the Atlantic coast of Central America in response to labor demand created by railroad and port construction. And I want to make clear that people are moving to various locations, right? Not just stopping and, and, um, and staying, but they're moving in between United Fruit plantations in Costa Rica, Panama Canal Zone, right, in Colón. So they're moving between spaces. And for this reason, to, in order to capture what happens here in the space requires a diaspora framework. So by the 20th century, the development of United Fruit and its multinational banana plantation export system um, in countries like Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, Cuba, Costa Rica, stimulated even more West Indian movement and relocation in the region. By 1910, the banana business boomed and around 20,000 West Indians had made their way to Costa Rica. By 1930, however, this population declined as the banana business suffered in the midst of plant disease and economic depression. So what's happening in my, uh, in my work is that I'm looking at this critical period where those who are remaining in Costa Rica wish for permanence and citizenship, right? So those others have moved on and the population uh, dwindles. So those who are staying in Costa Rica after the collapse of the banana industry and the withdrawal of United Fruit then desire permanence but would not obtain formal citizenship rights until 1948. And for many, this process would go well into the 1950s, right? This process of documentation. So here's another picture of um, this sort of omnipresence of bananas and banana production on the Atlantic coast of Costa Rica. This map of United Fruit operations illustrates the omnipresence of the multinational organization in the region. And this is important to think about how this shapes and stimulates West Indian labor migration across Central America and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. And Latin Americans refer to United Fruit as el pulpo, right, or the octopus with its many tentacles stretched across the region. Race and gender hierarchies shaped power relations on United Fruit plantations in the Panama Canal Zone and in other US-run enclaves where West Indians worked and lived. Excluded from most jobs tied into industry booms and multinational projects, West Indian women found their employment options largely limited to service jobs, domestic work, and also sex work. And Laura Putnam's work is instructive there. In the Panama Canal Zone, black workers and others were paid in silver, while white US workers were paid in gold, and plantation enclaves were set up to socially segregate white American officials and bosses from West Indian planters, cutters, timekeepers, and others. So in Limon, there are multiple colonial legacies at play here then, British, Spanish, and they overlap with this clear US neocolonialism that we can see happening in this map via United Fruit. Right, so West Indians are then British subjects at the time, but also living in this Jim Crow enclave and they're navigating these entangled landscapes of that anti-blackness. And explicitly anti-black nationalism is sweeping Costa Rica at this time, characterizing black residents of Limon as a foremost threat to the nation based on ideas of black inferiority and savagery. So how do, where do black people belong and how do they fit in this conception of, of Costa Rica? As Robert Carr writes, quote, alienation by and from states is constitutive of the shared history of black citizenship and of blackness as a socio-political category in the new world. In the era of colonial dominance in the British Caribbean and second class citizenship and violent suppression in the Jim Crow US, along with this growing anti-black nationalism in Latin America, the alienation that Carr writes about underpins the making of alternative spaces of citizenship by persons of African descent in the Americas. In other words, it's this context out of which Garveyism emerges, right? Because the geographies of black belonging, 
shaped by shared experiences of marginalization and dehumanization, had boundaries then that extended beyond the borders of nation states. So it only made sense that during this time, there would emerge a movement like Garveyism, which gained millions of adherents in various regions of the Americas and beyond. So in Latin America, there's this mythology of racial democracy and celebration of mestizaje or racial mixing that really hides the reality of racial hierarchy, anti-black racism, and explicitly anti-black state practices. In Costa Rica, um, there's a, a, a unique history in Central America in that the territory was small and peripheral in colonial Spanish America. The slave plantation system on the Atlantic coast and cacao, and here's the Atlantic coast here where Limon is, and cacao was the uh, crop that was primarily produced. But because it was such a small, unstable system, there was lots of fleeing and self-manumission. So this wasn't a stable slave plantation economy like we see elsewhere in Central America and, Southern, and South America. So because of this interesting colonial history, a national mythology emerged that suggests that since colonial times, Costa Rica has been racially homogenous. Right, there's this idea of racial homogeneity that's written in very explicit terms in this history. Right, and this idea that the authentic Costa Rican is then a descendant of Spanish farmers who settled the territory. Obviously, this narrative of history, right, very obviously obscures black and indigenous populations in colonial Costa Rica. And the legacy of this really remains today, right? Limon, which is historically where the majority of indigenous and black populations are and continue to be today, represents this other Costa Rica, right? Not a part of the Central Valley, right? And because of its tropical climate, its distance from the Central Valley, and also its racial composition. So there are anxieties about black foreign invasion in the 1920s and 1930s, right? While West Indians are, have increased visibility in Costa Rican news media. And this stimulates a renewed white national identity and the whitening of the working class masses. So why I think Costa Rica is such an important and instructive um, space to look at is that we can see sort of how whiteness operates in action, how this, uh, how whitening in Latin America operates on a nation state level. So whiteness then in Costa Rica was defined and made official through the census in very interesting ways. The 1927 census is a key source because it's instructive then on this process of whitening and also the value of whiteness in Latin America. Light-skinned Central Valley residents and also not so light-skinned Costa Ricans became white vis-a-vis -vis West Indians. Right? This is part of this dominant nationalism at the time. West Indian labor migrants recast Limon as in other Costa Rica yet again apart from, but outside of, the real nation. <clears throat> An excerpt from this 1927 census report reads, and I thought it was important to quote this passage here, as can be judged by these figures, the population of Costa Rica includes a high percentage of the white race. Now, I think it's important that these terms are clear, of the white race, right? This is how it's written in Spanish. The conditions of social and political order which have prevailed in our country and which have endowed us with those habits of peace and work so traditional among our people have been attributed to the racial homogeneity of the Costa Ricans. And this is a popular nationalist discourse that equates Costa Rican exceptionalism, and this term still used today, and peacefulness with its purported whiteness. And this is still very much in practice today. So this is the environment in which West Indians are trying to claim belonging and make um, uh, and claim right fitness for citizenship. This is the context. And then so there's this perception that these black foreign workers who some Costa Rican workers saw as privileged in this in these US run enclaves, it really angered Costa Ricans of varying classes. And there was this public disdain at this time for United Fruits imperialism. And this went hand in hand with a growing anti-black nationalism. 
So there are these ideas that West Indians were dangerous, savage, lawless, right? Uh, in my research, I'm looking at uh, newspapers, petitions, and we see this language of casting Limon as the site of uh, criminal activity, right, degeneracy, backward culture. A 1933 letter to Congress signed by 500 Costa Ricans, I'm sorry, Costa Rican workers in Limon, petitioned against the continued residence and employment of West Indians within the country, since in their estimation, it is not possible to get along with the blacks because their bad morals don't permit it. For them, the family does not exist, nor female honor. And for this reason, they live in overcrowding and promiscuity that is dangerous for our homes found in accordance with the precepts of religion and the good morals of Costa Ricans. Now, why I think this is such an interesting passage is, right, it not only helps us to, to, to think about how this white nationalism is shaped, right, against this idea of black savagery, but that it has particular uh, representations of black women's sexuality, right? So family doesn't exist for West Indians, neither does female honor. So in my work, I'm thinking about this relationship between race and gender and sexuality in this uh, making of white uh, Costa Rican nationalism. And this nationalism isn't just limited to newspapers, right, or petitions, but it's also reflected in the law. And this is important. There's so many discourses of Latin American history that have us thinking that um, uh, anti-black racism is more sentiment than um, in, uh, reflected in policy or law. But that's not the case here. So a companion law to the 1934 banana contract prohibited the employment of, quote, people of color in the new Pacific banana zone and racially prohibited, uh, and there are also laws racially prohibiting immigration and citizenship, right? And these were strengthened in the 1930s and 1940s. So there are these laws that we can see in practice. And in addition, there was a law in Limon restricting the patronage of a public pool. I'm sorry, excuse me, I know this. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, uh, there was a law restricting the patronage of a public pool to whites only and was an explicit attempt to not only separate the races but also to mark black bodies as unsanitary. And this sounds familiar to us, right? So there was this, uh, at, at insult to injury rather, there was this proposal of creating a separate pool for black residents of Limon. So with this increasing nationalization of Limon and attention to the region, because Costa Ricans are very anti-imperialist, right, confronting United Fruit, there's a transfer of United Fruit pr uh, production from the Atlantic to the Pacific side of the country, and the potential movement of West Indians outward from Limon became a national Negro problem, where previously foreign blackness was just a regional nuisance, right, restricted to Limon. So Congress enacted laws that sought to restrict black naturalization, employment, and the overall integration of black residents into the national body. So there's a lot happening in the slide that you can't see, but what I wanted to show was how these discourses of race were so frequently represented in, which th what this is is the most popular newspaper, daily newspaper at the time. So this is a, an article from 1930 where Jose Guerrero, who was the director of the 1927 census, which I've highlighted as being so instructive, he pens an essay, Como se quiere que sea Costa Rica, blanca o negra, right? What do we want Costa Rica to be, white or black? The Negro problem and the current banana contracts. Right, this runs in the most popular daily newspaper, and he's arguing using both eugenic and cultural arguments that West Indians pose a threat to the Costa Rican nation. And what I find interesting as well is, are the, um, uh, the numbers from the census, right? And so he's showing, one, the whiteness of the nation, right? This is what's important here, that in Costa, Costa Rica, there are 80% white population. And what this is meant to do as well is show that 
there can be a shift when we think about the province of San Jose and how it is now um, has such a low number of black people, but that this could shift at any time. It's this idea of a persistent threat of the, of the black population, which is mainly in Limon, moving into what's considered the heart of the nation or the Central Valley. <clears throat> So Guerrero is claiming that right, not only uh, are, are blacks degenerate in culture, but they also have a higher, in his language, predisposition to diseases like tuberculosis, leprosy, syphilis, and madness. So William Petgrave, who's an active member of the local UNIA and would go on to become president of Limon's Moine Junction branch, took to the local West Indian newspaper to counter Guerrero's attacks, to counter what we just saw, right? In the following week, he takes to the newspaper. He argues that West Indians had turned Limon from an undeveloped rainforest into a site of modern capitalist enterprise and had labored to create the most important industry in the nation, which was the banana industry. Having contributed to the modernization and enrichment of Costa Rica with their blood, sweat, and their lives, especially in the early years clearing out this uh, area, right? Uh, West Indians, in the words of Petgrave, quote, can, as much, can with as much reason claim Costa Rica as the land of their adoption as a Spaniard can. After all, he writes, the quote, unquote, in his words, real natives of Costa Rica were indigenous and not white. Questioning the whiteness of Costa Rica, quote, as white as they try to make it, he writes, Petgrave nonetheless affirms a belief in racial essentialism and an ideal of racial purity, arguing that blacks were, quote, as pure a race and as progressive a race as any other race groups, right? He's really borrowing from this language of Garveyism, right? At once claiming that black people are fit for modern citizenship, and on the other hand, maintaining this ideal of racial purity. So Petgrave's challenge to the claims of Guerrero in the census report is an important example of how Limon Garveyites applied the language and framework of Garveyism to intervene in anti-black nationalism in Costa Rica. It also reveals that West Indian newspapers published in Limon were a crucial site and vehicle of black definition, self-definition, and representation. Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association is arguably the most important black organization in the 20th century. And this is uh, from the cover of the UNIA membership card in Limon in the early 1920s. And these are the original, this is the original emphasis. So where you see caps or how it's emphasized on the card. So with branches in the US, the Caribbean, and Latin America, right, Africa and elsewhere, the UNIA, according to the organization's figure, figures, was comprised of four million members by 1920. Part of the appeal of Garveyism to people in various parts of the black world was that it gave Africans and people of African descent a language and a frame of analysis through which to counter white supremacy and European colonialism. A young Marcus Garvey worked as a timekeeper on United Fruit Plantations in Limon in 1910. And this is significant because it's his first time traveling and living outside of Jamaica, right? This is Garvey's pre-Harlem experiences. And I think these are important in shaping his ideas about what would become the UNIA. So his experiences in Costa Rica and then Panama, and he goes on to other Latin American nations, right? His experiences of racial hierarchy and segregation in United Fruit Enclaves shape this uh, Garvey's politics and vision, right? And also his experiences of Central American anti-black racism. So as this cover of the UNIA membership in Limon shows, right, there's this goal of creating an African empire, right? Sustained by black industry and capitalism. For Garvey, quote, a race without authority and power is a race without respect. So this is his main goal, right? The creation of an African nation for people dispersed in an African empire. <clears throat> 
So the way Garvey thinks about power is very much influenced by this age of empire. And we can see it in the way that he's dressed, right? In response to this alienation and exclusion and lack of citizenship, Garvey's ultimate goal was to create a black nation, run nation in Africa where people of African descent, right from the Americas, etc., could repatriate. And the Black Star shipping line um, was his central industrial effort. And this is likely influenced by the United Fruits ships, which were called the Great White Fleet. The UNIA was the central organizing factor in the West Indian community in Limon in the 1920s. I think this is important to note. And there were as many as 23 branches spread over the province of Limon. And in fact, Central America was a stronghold of Garveyism. By 1926, 45% of all non-US chapters of the UNIA were located in just three countries, Cuba, Panama, and Costa Rica. West Indians in Limon continued to participate in uh, the UNIA and identify as Garveyites through the 1930s, 40s, and beyond. So as doors were slamming shut across the Americas in the 20s and 30s, we think about these race-based restrictions on immigration, right, passed in the US and Latin America. West Indians are desiring permanence and the rights of citizenship in Limon, while at the same time advocating for a strengthened Africa. And these are some of the um, front pages of the Negro World newspaper, which is the main organ of the UNIA, which people are reading in Limon, right? This is circulating across the transnational community. And these uh, front pages give you some idea about what's important to Garviates, right? The shipping company, the Black Star Line, Africa, the land of hope and promise for Negro peoples of the world, right? And African redemption, which is this major uh, phrase that we see over and over in Garveyite discourse, right? Redeeming Africa. And I'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> so um, a government, and, and, and what's so interesting about what's happening in Limon is that I'm looking at how West Indians are thinking about and petitioning and making claims to belonging in Costa Rica, but they're also very actively participating in thinking about and talking about Africa as their homeland, right? This is clear in their newspapers as well, right? A government by and for Negroes in a free and redeemed Africa, right, as one Limon Searchlight editor wrote, is what he calls the remedy for manhood repressed in the black world at large, right? So there's this idea that people who are dispersed, right, will continue to be uh, disenfranchised while their homeland is weak, right? But what's interesting about what's happening is in Limon, and we can argue in other places in the UNIA uh, diaspora, is that redemption enabled certain powers of critique within nations in the Americas. So going back to Africa was, by and large, right, an ideological move rather than a physical one for Garveyites in Limon. But this had ideological power. So the circulation of the Negro world beyond uh, right, the borders of Harlem, where the uh, organization was headquartered, helped to delineate a black world beyond national borders. It connected disparate black communities and put them in conversation with one another. As the Negro world featured news from various parts of Africa and the African diaspora. Within this transnational space of belonging that's shaped by circulation of information, migration and relocation and shared experiences of exclusion, black people claimed a kind of modern citizenship that was denied to them in the Americas and colonized Africa. Garveyism and the transnational circulation of the Negro world helped to shape new geographies of black belonging and new articulations of Pan-African solidarity. Local black newspapers in Limon, Costa Rica in many ways mirrored the style of the Negro world. So we will see new stories from across the diaspora, an emphasis on what's happening on the African continent, etc. The Limon Searchlight was a pro Garvey West Indian owned and edited, right, um, by, edited by a former UNIA branch president. So what we see is the local news media in Limon very much shaped by Garveyism, right? Most of the Garveyites 
are the ones who are doing the journalistic work. So the Searchlight is one newspaper and another is the uh, Voz del Atlantico, which wasn't West Indian owned but featured West Indian columnists in the English section. So uh, this cover is so interesting to me because it highlights how, especially in the 1930s, right, around 1934, this um, anxiety around um, Abyssinia's uh, independence being compromised via Italy. So there was this call for action amongst uh, West Indians in Limon to, to protect, and, and some even wished to go to Abyssinia to fight against the Italians themselves. So, the, so there's very much this, um, uh, this uh, diasporic citizenship that happens via the newspaper. So Garveyism was applied and put to work then in various ways across the black world, but I think there's something interesting about how it's adapted in Limon, right, in this particular context of Central America. So I'm thinking about these complexities. On the one hand, uh, there's this way in which we can think about Garveyism as producing certain conservative uh, and reactionary politics, in another way, radical and insurgent ones. So in some parts of the, uh, in the Caribbean, Garveyism was aligned with labor movements and increased radicalization. But Limon uh, Garveyites took a staunch anti-union, anti-strike position in a climate of increased labor position, uh, opposition, I'm sorry, labor organization by other workers in the enclave. At the UNIA's global peak, the British consulate, in conjunction with Costa Rican authorities, sought to ban the importation of the Negro world into Limon, but by 1921, Garvey was welcomed as a hero of sorts by United Fruit officials in Limon, and even corresponded with the president of Costa Rica. So he goes from having his newspaper, uh, attempts to have the newspaper banned, to being welcomed as a hero. So why is this? Right? Because the UNIA took a staunch anti-strike, anti-communist position, Garveyism in Limon helped to maintain the status quo in important ways, kept black workers on the job, and thwarted multiracial and multi-ethnic worker solidarity. And this reveals these complications that I'm talking about. So in my work, I'm thinking about how to manage these complications, not just in terms of space, right? Like, where you belong, moving between nation and diaspora, but also how to manage these complexities of Pan-Africanism uh, itself, right? So I think about redemptive geographies as being an alternative space, right? I'm thinking about how West Indians craft an alternative space of belonging and citizenship, right? How they're using the space to make uh, discursive and political claims and construct new relations of power and new representations of themselves, right? They're challenging their marginal position within local and global hierarchies of race. But at the same time, redemption, right, um, is delineated by certain kinds of, certain specific kinds of culture, gender, and sexual politics. So the crafting of redemptive geographies, while it's a strategy of survival, right, it creates certain exclusive borders when it comes to the black community, right? Certain types of black culture and behavior, certain kinds of unsanctioned sexual and cultural practices were then outside of the redeemed community. So for me, this example of um, uh, anxieties around voodoo and pokomania, right, what was called voodoo in the newspaper, are instructive on how redemptive geographies draw certain lines within black communities in Limon, right? So Garveyites in Limon are rejecting West Indian culture, particularly working class West Indian culture, that did not fit into the framework of redemption, right? Producing redeemed narrative of, narratives of Africa, claiming black civilization, um, right? So, so this, these kinds of practices, right, challenge this notion of black modernity. Advocating as one, as one uh, West Indian Garvey writes, Garveyism instead of voodooism, in his words, they considered African-derived Caribbean spiritual practices backward and a danger to their efforts to redefine blackness and Africanness as modern and worthy of white respect. And what I find that's so 
compelling is that there's this connection between the language that Jose Guerrero uses, the census director, who claims that right, right, black people would lead to cultural de degeneracy, and he's very much focused on witchcraft himself, this idea of witchcraft, quote unquote. But Garveyites are taking up that very same language to, to, to argue that these kinds of practices actually challenge right, black citizenship. Right? So UNIA leaders in Limon sought the prosecution and deportation of, per of persons who practiced pocomania and other Afro-Caribbean religious practices. Right? So these uh, types of practices then threatened a certain kind of black modernity that Garveyites held as key to making new black subjectivities. So while uh, forging these redemptive geographies represented a critique of dominant ideas of blackness, it really left intact a lot of the overarching logic of race thinking that's popular at the time, right? So this idea of racial purity, right? There's lots of conversations around eugenics and racial rejuvenation in the Garveyite archives, right? And this is a reflection of the time. So diasporic citizenship had these exclusive contours, and that's what I'm thinking about um, in, in the book. So it's, what's complex is that while, while Garveyites are crafting certain conservative politics in Limon, at the same time these stateless West Indians are utilizing the language of Garveyism to lay claim to belonging and to path to chart the path for official citizenship. What I see happening and what's so instructive in the archives are the ways that Garveyism is gendered in very explicit ways. So while requiring branches of the UNIA to have both a male and a female president, Garvey regularly addresses his followers as, quote, fellow men of the Negro race, right? The very notion of liberation was gendered, and Garvey characterized settlements in Liberia as a place where blacks could, quote, enjoy the pure atmosphere of manly freedom. So entangled in these uh, narratives of rewriting of African history, desire for African empire, there are these cravings for certain types of manhood. As Hazel Carby writes, you know, scholars take for granted this gendering at work in the production of race men. But it's so clear in the archives, these anxieties around gender and sexuality. So in her 1922 message for the uh, Negro Women of the World, which appeared in, in the Negro World newspaper, the lady president of Philadelphia and the women presidents were called lady presidents, right? She declared that, quote, the redemption of Africa depends on the motherhood of black women. And there are the, there's this conversation around how uh, it's up to black women to reproduce right, a strong future nation and society, right? The, that there are unique burdens placed on black women in the re reproduction of a black world. And the organization is gendered in very, very particular ways. But at the same time, Garvey women, right, seemingly trans transgress the Victorian model of womanhood and the cult of domesticity, right? They seemingly do that, but at the same time, they affirm many of the dominant framings of black women's inherent sexual immorality, right? There are these many articles around instructing young women to immerse themselves in intellectual pursuits and activities that derailed bodily and sexual deviance, right? Thought of as intuitive in some ways, instinctual. Right? But the Negro world and the newspapers are still the space where women can sort of challenge dominant framings of patriarchy and, if you will, navigate between patriarchal ideas and early feminism. And of course, the work of Barbara Baer, Eula Taylor, and others help us think about the ways that uh, Garveyite women sort of shape the space on their own terms. And my point here is to show that Garveyite women were not passive in participants in the UNIA, that they actually helped to shape this space and they define redemption in their own ways. So what's interesting also is how the, the movement between the Negro world and the local uh, newspapers in Limon, so there's this 
give and take, right? There are uh, Central American women who are um, writing for the Negro world and their reproduction of Negro world articles in local uh, West Indian newspapers. And so this is fascinating to me. Here's an image of Amy Jakes Garvey, second wife of Garvey, Henrietta Vinson, who is um, uh, one of the most famous Garveyite women here. And of course, Amy Jakes Garvey takes on this project of a, a column in the Negro world, Our Women and What They Think. So that's a really rich source to think about how women craft and sort of define Pan-Africanism uh, in the UNIA newspaper. So while uh, women, Garvey women affirm, you know, these domestic and maternal roles, they're also demanding the right to work on par with women, I'm sorry, with men, both in the office and in the platform. So we see these examples of what we can say early feminism in these archives. And in the 1930s, community leaders in Limon argued that the behavior of women would determine the ability of West Indians to attain the respect of the Costa Rican community. And for me, this is very similar to what Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham describes as respectability, right? amongst black Baptist women in the United States. She argues that they, quote, adhered to a politics of respectability that equated public behavior with individual self-respect and with the advancement of African Americans as a group. So this idea of uh, an emphasis on how one acts in, in public, self-adornment, uh, etc., I very much see echoed in, uh, in Limon. Right? So to prove fitness for modern citizenship, West Indian leaders campaigned against cultural practices that did not adhere to the politics of respectability, including those that challenged and troubled the bourgeois family structure, heterosexuality, and monotheistic Christianity. And here is just one of many of the uh, news articles that focus on young women's behavior. Right? Immorality amongst our girls, the obnoxious language on our streets, Philomel is serious talk with girls, which is a re reoccurring um, column, right? There's just real anxiety around how young women behave on the streets of Limon. There's a literary and sports club created, right? Uh, the Young Women's Standard Club, which is a UNIA spinoff that sought to, quote, subdue the darker passions and reclaim those women who might have erred. So in this language, there's very much one of anxiety around young women's sexuality. And these clubs reaffirm the divisions and hierarchies between UNIA West Indians and those on the outside of this Garveyite community, showcasing respectable young women as examples of the true nature of black women at large. And one thing I'd like to quickly say, I'm running out of time, so I want to go ahead and get to the conclusion, is that there are these um, moments where West Indian women are also seem very anxious around interracial sex. So for me, I think about how they are confronting this uh, uh, representation of black sexuality in, the, in Costa Rican media by saying that, in fact, um, uh, black people have black pride and want to stay amongst themselves, right? So they're countering this idea of unbridled black sexuality by arguing that it is in fact uh, uh, race pride that will keep the races separated. So there's this very interesting dance between these Garvey ideas and the context of what's happening in Costa Rica. Okay, so I have so much more, but you can, you can read that in, in my article. So let me just conclude by just thinking about the legacies of Garveyism in contemporary uh, Costa Rica, which I think is important. So I look at this time period, uh, not just to show how it reveals uh, black citizenship as an ongoing process, but also to think about how um, Garveyism and the UNIA still hold very much uh, a high significance right, in the cultural politics of contemporary Limon. So even as the UNIA declined globally, and Garvey's obviously deported from the US in 1927, and he dies in 1940, Garveyism continues to resonate amongst West Indians in Limon, and the UNIA continues to exist today. And unfortunately, the slides I'm gonna show you, the next two of the Liberty Hall building in Puerto Limon, uh, represent a building that no longer exists, because just this past April, the building caught fire. 
right? So this is a, a, the placard from the 1922 building of this uh, structure, right? Which was a very important location and symbol of Garvey's lasting influence. And it was a space where people still held buildings, uh, meetings, the UNIA still held meetings. Uh, aside from UNIA functions, there were, um, this was a major community institution where black limonenses celebrated birthdays, weddings, and other major events, right? On the floor, the ground floor of the building was a restaurant called the Black Star Line. So we can see embedded in the center of, Port Le or of Puerto Limon is this, uh, was this right, clear indication of Garvey's long-lasting legacy. And th this kind of imagery you'll see across the Caribbean coast right, of Costa Rica, which to me reflects this continued uh, positioning of, of, of those of West Indian heritage between a West Indian identity right, or a larger black identity and Costa Rican identity. So this, there's a still balance, right, in situating oneself at these intersections. So we see the flag of, of Jamaica on one side and the flag of Costa Rica on the other. And of course, some of the iconography that you'd recognize if you've been in the right, British Caribbean, right, these sort of Pan-African figures. So Afro-Costa Rica, in conclusion, is an underrepresented region in, in African diaspora studies, but I think that it offers significant insight into diaspora citizenship and black politics. Oops. Black citizenship, as I mentioned, is an ongoing process. Limon is still a marginalized and underdeveloped part of the nation. Garveyism in, Cent in Central America then gives us continued insight on not only these marginalizations, but also how black people continue to utilize black internationalism, right? So with my historical work, we can see how there's much more work to be done in thinking about interwar black nationalism beyond what US, right, black Americans are doing and beyond the scope of the United States. But that I, I think that this also helps us to interrogate right, the gender and sexuality politics of Garveyism and Pan-Africanism and thinking through some of these complexities and limitations, right, grappling with the politics of gender helps us to see lots of different things um, if we think about Pan-Africanism, right? So sexual politics, including ideas about reproduction and anxieties about unsanctioned black female sexuality, are part and parcel of black internationalism and imaginings of black freedom. And I think in our current uh, stage where we are, it's important to kind of think through some of these limitations, right, and how we carry these forth in 2016. So finally, Epsi Campbell, who is an economist an organizer, she's run for vice president and president of Costa Rica, right? And a former president of the Transnational Organization for Black Women, the Red de Mujeres Afro. She explains, I am Costa Rican and in terms of my cultural identity, an African descendant, right? And I think this is instructive on how black people of West African heritage, right? Continue, West Indian heritage, continue to identify, organize, and also make demands at the interstices of nation and diaspora. Thank you.